Hey everybody, today we're going to be uh, reading chapter 10 of Laura Hildeman's book, Unbroken. Um, before I get started, I just want to uh, thank everybody for um, all the likes and watches and views and subscribers. Uh, I really appreciate, um, actually what am I saying, this video and channel has no likes or views or subscribers. It has like 10 views, but like this, this series that I've spent hours doing, nobody's watched them. Not even one person, not even myself. Why am I going to watch them? I just read them. So I'm obviously not doing them for instant view gratification. All right, there's obviously a bigger reason for this. And you can't denounce, denounce or deny the quality of these videos and these series. Um, this is very well written. Uh, this is a niche that's not being taken over on YouTube. It's not being uh, used. There's a few other people that do read books. Uh, but they don't do it as well as I do. Um, so hit the thumbs butt, um, the thumbs butt up and, and uh, thank you. Thank you from the past to the future. And thanking you in the past for future praise that I received from you. So thank you, even though this is in the past, but thank you for that future praise. Okay, the stinking six. <clears throat> As evening fell over Funafuti, the ground crews nursed the damaged bombers. When the holes were patched and mechanical problems repaired, the planes were fueled and loaded with six 500-pound bombs each, ready to strike on Tara the next day. Superman, that's the plane that they're riding in, that's their plane, Louis and, and uh, Pete, or whatever, still standing there at that suspended halt. Its entire honeycomb would join them. It would probably never fly again. Worn out from the mission and hours spent at the infirmary, Louis walked to a grove of coconut trees where there were tents serving as barracks. He found his tent and flopped down on a cot near Phil. The journalists were in a tent next to theirs. At the infirmary, Stanley Pillsbury lay with his bleeding leg hanging off his cot. Nearby, the other wounded Superman crewman tried to sleep. Blackout descended and a hush fell. Silence before the storm, sounds like. At about three in the morning, Louis woke to a forlorn droning, rising and falling. It was a small plane crossing back and forth overhead. Thinking that it was a crew lost in the clouds, Louis lay there listening, hoping they'd find home. Eventually, the sound faded away. Before Louis could fall back to sleep, he heard the growl of heavy aircraft engine. Then, from the north end of the atoll, came a boom! A siren began sounding, and there was distant gunfire. Then, a marine ran past the airman's tent, screaming, Air Raid! Air Raid! The droning overhead hadn't been a lost American crew. It had probably been a scout plane, leading Japanese bombers. Funafuti was under attack. The airmen and journalists, Louis and Phil among them, jammed their feet into their boots, bolted from the tents and stopped, some shouting, others spinning in panic. They couldn't see any bomb shelters. From down the atoll, the explosions were coming in rapid succession, each one louder and closer. The ground shook. I looked around and said, holy hell, where are we going to go? Remembered pilot John Dacey. The best shelter we could find was a shallow pit dug around a coconut swally, and he plowed into it. Along most of him, were, uh, along with most of the men near him, Henry Herman Shisi, DC's radio man, left him to entrench next to an ordnance truck, joining five of his crewmates. Pilot Jesse State jumped into a, another hole nearby. Three men crawled under the ordnance truck. I wouldn't crawl under a truck. Another flung himself into a garbage pit. One man ran right off the end of the atoll, splashing into the ocean. That's what I would do. Even though he didn't know how to swim, some men, that's what I would also do. Some men, finding nowhere to go, dropped to their knees to claw foxholes in the sand with their helmets. As he dug in the dark with bombs coming, one man noisily cursed the son of a bitch generals who left him in the atoll without any shelters. My cats are fighting. Dozens of natives crowded into a large missionary church. They stood in the clearing, realizing that the white church would stand out brilliantly on the dark atoll. A marine named Fonny Black Lad ran in and yelled to the natives to get out. When they wouldn't move, he drew his sidearm and they scattered. In the infirmary, Stanley Pillsbury lay in startled confusion. One moment he'd been sleeping, and the next the atoll was rocking with explosions. A siren was howling and people were sprinting by, dragging patients onto stretchers and rushing them out. Then the room was empty and Pillsbury was alone. He had apparently been forgotten. He sat up, frantic. He couldn't stand. Louis and Phil ran through the coconut grove, searching for anything that might serve as a shelter. 
The bombs were overtaking them, making a sound that one man like the footholds of a giant. Boom, 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 boom. At last, Louis and Phil spotted a native, but built, a native hut built on flood stilts. They dove under it, landing in a heap of more than two dozen men. The bombs were now so close that the men could hear the spinning in the air. DC remembered the sound as whirr, scarcing, as a piercing as a, wh as a whistle. An instant later, everything was scolding, whiteness, and splintering noise. The ground heavied, and the air whooshed around, carrying an ar arid smell. Trees blew apart. A bomb struck the tent in which Louis and Phil had been sleeping a minute before. Another burst beside a pile of men in the ditch, and something speared into the back of the man on top. He said, This feels like it, boys, and passed out. A bomb hit the ordnance truck, sending it into the air in a thousand pieces. The remains of the truck and the men under it skimmed past Jesse Stay's head. A nose gunner heard a singing sound as the parts of the truck flew by him. It was apparently the truck that landed on one of the tents, which two airmen were still on their cots. Another bomb tumbled into Seacher's trench, plopping right on top of the tail gunner. It didn't go off, but sat there hissing. The gunner shouted, Jesus! It took them the moment to realize that what they thought was a bomb was actually a fire extinguisher. Yards away, Louis and Phil huddled. The hut shook, but still stood. But stood, still stood. The bombs moved down its hole. Each report sunk further away, and then the explosion stopped. A few men climbed from their shelters to help the wounded and douse fires. Louis and the others stayed where they were, knowing that the bombers would be back. Matches were struck and cigarettes were pinched to trembling fingers. I don't smoke anymore. If we're hit, one man grumbled, there would be nothing left of us but gravy. Far away, the bombers turned. The booming began again. I don't smoke, but if I was on an island in this position, I'd probably smoke. Someone running by the infirmary saw Pillsbury, hurried in, threw him on a stretcher, and dragged him into a tiny cement building where the other wounded had been taken. The building was so crowded that the men had laid on shelves. It was pitch dark, and doctors were shuffling around, peering at their patients by flashlight. Pillsbury lay panting in the darkness, listening to the bombs coming, feeling claustrophobic, his mind flashing with the images of bombs entombing, entombing them. With men stacked everywhere and no one speaking, he thought of a morgue. His leg hurt. He began groaning, and the doctors felt as him felt to him and gave him morphine. The booming was louder, louder, and then it was all over again, tremendous crashing. The ceiling shuddered and cement dust sifted out. Outside, it was hell on earth. Men moaned and screamed, one calling for his mother. A pilot thought the voices sounded like animals crying. That's what it was. Men's eardrums burst. A man died of a heart attack. Another man's arm was severed. Others sobbed, prayed, and lost control of their bowels. I wasn't only scared, I was terrified, one airman, airman wrote to his parents. I thought I was scared in the air, but I wasn't. It was the first time in my life I saw just how close death could come. Film fate felt the same. Never even during the fight over Nauru had he known such terror. Louis crouched beside him as he had run through the coconut grove, and he had moved only on instinct and roaring adrenaline, feeling no emotion. Now, as explosions went off around him, fear seized him. Staff Sergeant Frank Rosenek huddled in a coral trench, wearing nothing but a helmet, untied shoes, and boxer shorts. The tonnage coming down, he later wrote, seemed like a railroad car load. The bomb sounded like someone pushing a piano down a long ramp before they hit and exploded. Big palm trees were shattered and splintered all around us. The ground would rise up in the air when a bomb exploded, and there was a terrific flash of super bright light that it made. The concussion blew pieces of coral into our hole, and we were blinded. We groped for them and tossed them out as quick as we could find them. At intervals between a bomb fall and fa falling, it sounded like church, voices from nearby slit trenches, all chanting the Lord's Prayer together, over and over again. Louder, when the bombs hit closer, I thought I even heard some guys crying. You were afraid to look up because you felt your face might be seen from above. <clears throat> Two more soldiers were killed on the third pass. On the fourth pass, the Japanese hit the jackpot. Two bombs, bulldyed, gassed up, loaded B-24s parked by the runway. The first went up in a huge explosion, sending bomber parts showering all over the island. Another burst into flames. The fire set off machine gun bullets which whizzed in all directions, their tracers drawing ribbons in the air. This was dark right before sun sunrise. Then the 500-pound bombs on the plane started going off. Finally, the atoll fell silent. A few of the men, shaking, stood up. As they walked along the wreckage, another B-24 blew up. The explosion accelerated by its 2,300 gallons of fuel, 3,000 pounds of bombs, and cache of 50 caliber ammunition. And ammunition. A co-pilot wrote that it sounded like the whole island was blowing up. With that, it was over. 
When dawn broke, men began creeping from their hiding places. The man who had ran into the ocean waded ashore, having clung to a rock for three hours as the tide rose. That was me. No, it wasn't, but it would have been if I was there. With morning light, the man who had cursed his generals had he had he dug the, his foxhole discovered that those generals had actually been digging right next to him. Louis and Phil crawled out from beneath the hut. Phil was unscathed. Louis had a cut on his arm. They joined a procession of exhausted, stunned men. Funafuti was wrecked. A bomb had struck the church roof, sending the building down onto itself. But thanks to Corporal Ladd, there had been no one inside. There was a crater where Louis and Phil's tent had been. Another tent lay collapsed, a bomb standing on its nose in the middle of it. Someone tied the bomb to a truck, dragged it to the beach, and turned sharply, sending the bomb skidding into the ocean. Rosenek walked up the run runway and found six Japanese bombs lying in a neat row. The bombs were armed by spinning as they fell, but whoever had dropped them had come in too low, not leaving the bombs enough drop space to arm themselves. The men dragged them into the ocean, too. Where the struck B-24s had been, there were deep holes ringed by decapitated coconut trees. One crater, Louis noted in his diary, was 35 foot deep and 60 feet across. Those coconut trees, their roots go way down. I've lived in Hawaii five years. And on farms, I've lived on farms. Everywhere, landing gear and seats, there had been the sunset from one side of Funafuti greeted the sunrise from the other. All that was left of one bomber was a tail, two wing pipes, and two propellers connected by a black smudge. There was a 1,200 horsepower Pratt and Whitney engine sitting by itself on the runway. The plane that it belonged to was nowhere to be found. Louis came up upon a reporter staring into a crater in tears. Louis walked to him, bracing to see a dead body. Instead, he saw a typewriter, flattened. The wounded and dead were everywhere. Two mechanics who had been caught in the open were bruised all over from the concussive force of the explosions. They were so traumatized that they couldn't talk and they were using their hands to communicate. Men stood in a solemn circle around a couple of seats of twisted metal, all that was left of the ordnance truck. The three men who had sought shelter under it were beyond recognition. A radio man was found dead, a bomb sh shard in his head. A radio man was found dead, a bomb shard in his head. Louis came upon the body of a native dressed in a loincloth laying on his back. Half of his head was missing. A radio operator would say that there had been 14 Japanese bombers, but thinking that there had been two sets of three, someone dubbed them the Stinking Six. That's the name of this chapter, the Stinking Six. Everyone expected them to return. Phil and Louis joined a group of men digging foxholes with shovels and helmets. When they had a moment, they walked to the beach and sat together for an hour, trying to collect their thoughts. Sometime that day, Louis went to the infirmary to help out. Pillsbury was back in his cot. His leg was burning terribly, and he lay with a dangling in the air, dripping blood into a puddle on the floor. Coopernell saw him, thanking him for shooting down that zero. The doctor was concerned that Pillsbury's foot wouldn't stop bleeding. Surgery was necessary, but there was no anesthetic, so Pillsbury was just going to have to do without. With Pillsbury gripping the bed with both hands and Louis lying over his legs, the doctors used pliers to tear tissue from Pillsbury's foot then put a long strip of hanging skin over the bone stump and sewed it up. Superman sat by the airstrip, listing leg up peg leg landing gear, the shredding tire having partway off. The air ray had missed the plane, but it didn't look like it. Its 595 holes were spread over every part of it. Swarms of bullet holes slashed from shrapnel, four cannon fire gashes, at least as that of a large man's head, the gaping punch hole beside Pillsbury turn, and a hole in the rudder as big as a doorway. The plane looked as if it had flown through barbed wire. Its paint scoured off the leading edge of the engines and sides. Journalists and airmen circled it in amaze that it had stayed airborne for five hours with so much damage. Phil was held as a miracle worker, and everyone had caused them to reassess the supposedly faint-hearted B-24s. A photographer climbed inside the plane and snapped a picture. Taken in daylight in the dark of the plane's interior, the image showed shafts of light streaming in through the holes, a shower of stars against the black sky. That'd be a nice picture. Louis, looking as a, a battered as his plane, walked to the Superman. He leaned his head into one of the cannon holes and saw the severed right rudder cables still spliced together as he had left them. He ran his finger along the tears of Superman's skin, the, the tears of Superman's skin. The plane had saved him from all but one of his crew, saved all but one of his crew. He would think of it as a dear friend. <clears throat> Look at Pillsbury's leg and announce... Louis boarded another plane and began his journey back to Hawaii with Phil, Coopernell, Mitchell, and the bandaged glassman. Pillsbury, Lambert, and Douglas were too badly wounded to rejoin the crew. 
In a few days, they'd be sent to Samoa, where a doctor would take one look at Pillsbury's leg and announce that it had been hamburgered. Lambert would be hospitalized for five months. When a general presented him with a Purple Heart, Lambert apparently couldn't sit up, so the general pinned the medal to his sheet. Douglas's war was done. Brooks was lying in a grave in Funafuti Marine Corps Cemetery. The crew was broken up forever. They would never see Superman again. An oppressive weight settled on Louis as he flew away from Funafuti. He and the remains of the crew stopped at Canton. They flew on to Palomar Atoll, where Louis took a hot shower and watched they died with their boots on at a base theater. It was the movie he had been working on as an extra when the war had begun, a lifetime ago. Interesting. I'm going to watch that movie. Back on Hawaii, he sank onto a cold torpor. He was irritable and withdrawn. Phil, too, was off kilter, drinking a few too many, seeming not himself. Alcohol will do that to a person. With a gutted crew and no plan, the men weren't called for assignment, so they killed time in Honolulu. When a drunken hothead tried to pick a fight, Phil stared back indifferently, but Louis obliged. The two stomped outside to have it out, and the hothead backed out. Later, drinking beer with friends, Louis couldn't bring himself to be sociable. He holed up in his room, listening to music. His only other solace was running, slogging through the sand around the Kuhuku runway, thinking of the 1944 Olympics, trying to forget Harry Brooks' plan to deface. The Olympics. Well. On May 24th, Louis, Phil, and the uh, other Superman veterans were transferred to the 42nd Squadron of the 11th Bomb Group. The 42nd would be stationed on the eastern edge of Oahu, on the gorgeous beach at Kualoa. Ko Ku Kualoa. Six new men were brought in to replace the lost Superman crew men. Flying with unfamiliar men worried Louis from Phil. Don't like the idea a bit. Louis once wrote in his diary, Every time they mix up a crew, they have a crack up. Among the Superman veterans, the only thing that seemed noteworthy about the new men was that their tail gunner, a sergeant from Cleveland named Francis Ma McNamara, had such an affinity for sweets that he ate practically nothing but dessert. The men called him Mac. For the moment, they had no plane. Liberators destined for the 11th bomb group were being flown in from other combat areas, and the first five, peppered with bullet holes, had just arrived. One of them, Green Hornet, looked haggard, its sides splattered with something black, the paint worn off the engines. Even with an empty bomb bay and all four engines going, it was just only able to stay airborne. It tended to fly with its tail dragging, below its nose, something the airmen called mushing, a reference to the mushy feel of the controls of a faltering plane. Engineers went over the bomber but found no explanation. All of the airmen were wary of Green Hornet. The bomber was relegated to errands, and the ground crewmen began prying parts off of it for use on other planes. Louis went up in it for a short heap, came back and referred to it as the craziest plane, and hoped he'd never have to fly in it again. On May 26th, Louis packed up his belongings and caught a ride to his new Kualoa Dukes, a private cottage 30 feet from the ocean. Louis, Phil, Mitchell, and Cooperneau would have the place all to themselves. That afternoon, Louis stayed in, transforming the garage into his private room. Phil went to a squatter meeting where he met a rookie pilot, George Smitty Smith. By coincidence, a close friend of Cece's. After the meeting, Phil lingered late with Smitty, talking about Cece. Cece is Phil's girlfriend back home, his fiance. They, they kept on trying to get married. Hopefully they get married. At the cottage, Louis turned in. The next day, he, Phil, and Cooper know were going to Honolulu to take another crack at P.Y. Chong Steaks. I gotta find that place. Across the island at Hickam Field, that's over near my church, nine crewmen and one passenger climbed aboard a B-24. The crew, piloted by a Tennessean named Clarence Coburning had just come from San Francisco and was on its way to Canton, then Australia. As the men on the ground watched, the plane lifted off, banked south, and flew out of sight. So it looks like this guy, Tennessean guy is going to come up in the next chapter. That, that was chapter 10, The Smoking Six, in Laura Hildebrand's book. Um, once again, uh, my name is Gregory Brandt, and uh, hit the thumbs up button, and uh, I'll continue on. Uh, one thing that they don't mention in the book, which I gathered from the reading and from the objective uh, and empirical evidence is that um, when Superman went out and was bombed in the fighter, they went out to the bombing, got like attacked with in the previous chapter 594 holes, and they barely escaped the Japanese zeros. They went back to the island and they, they landed and they barely made it and it skidded there. But what they did was they also led all those Japanese back because the very night, you know, they get bombed. The, the, they were being followed all the way back to their base. So that doesn't, that's not mentioned in the book, but hey, 
you get that they they have to take some blame for that. So. Or I mean, that's what I noticed. I don't. I think they probably led them back to their base if they had like a secret base out in the Pacific. So. Okay. Once again, uh, send this somewhere or uh, click the thumbs up. And uh, thanks for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I know there's a movie about this, um, but um, you know you can only get so much for the book too. So keep reading. And uh, you know, I, um, this is a great idea, and I'm really glad I'm doing this channel. Uh, feel free to check out my other channels, Gregory Brandt. And uh, my first book, Gonzo Education, I'm also going to read that book on this channel as well. Uh, that was the initial reason for this channel. Uh, feel free to check it out on Amazon. It's free right now. It's a story of my uh, 15 years of my life. That's Gonzo, G-O-N-Z-O, Education, E-D-U-C-A-T-I-O-N. All right, thanks. Have a nice day.